This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Tableau Software and Dole Food Company. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us from remote outposts over the Internet today. Thank you for being with us again. In just a moment, one of our country's foremost Mexican cartel and heroin experts, Mr. Stephen Peterson will be here to shed light on how abundant the supply of heroin has become in the U.S. and where exactly it's coming from. But before Mr. Peterson joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Stephen R. Peterson received his degree in criminal justice from Northeastern University and subsequently pursued his graduate degree at the University of North Carolina. He has worked for the Department of Justice and the Drug Enforcement Administration, also known as the DEA, for nearly three decades, taking on some of the agency's most dangerous and difficult investigations. Peterson was the most senior DEA street agent in the country when he retired from government service to continue his work in the commercial sector. For 11 years, he worked as the DEA Atlanta Field Division Training Coordinator, where he trained DEA agents, task force officers, state and local police officers, and civilians in Georgia, Tennessee, and North and South Carolina. More than 80,000 drug enforcement experts have benefited from Peterson's hands-on training. And so it comes as no surprise that he's the recipient of an unprecedented 85 awards for his work, including the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Drug Enforcement Officers Association. Among Peterson's many accomplishments is his work as a DEA firearms instructor, defensive tactics instructor, tactic raids instructor, and acting as a member of the DEA's traumatic incident response team. In 2010, Peterson took over the National Law Enforcement Speakers Bureau, a network of experienced enforcement experts who provide education around the world. Yet despite his dangerous work in the drug trade, from field to street, Stephen Peterson describes himself as an average guy battling the forces of evil in extraordinary ways. It's my pleasure to welcome to the program one of the last lines of defense between powerful cartels and the violence which comes part and parcel with drug trafficking, Mr. Stephen Peterson. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Peterson. Well, thank you, Rebecca. And uh, my dad is Mr. Peterson. I'm just Steve. <laughs> okay. I thought you might start with something like that. Uh, <laughs> you, you're, you, one of your characteristics throughout your work has been you, you've been remarkably humble. Uh, and, uh, I, and, and I appreciate that very much. Actually, I had a friend of mine tell me that one of the sure signs of every leader is persistence along with humility. And I, I think we can safely say that you meet both those criteria. Now, now most of us uh, don't know a lot about heroin. So just to get the conversation going today, could you tell us whether there are different types of heroin and where the heroin originates from before finding its way into the U.S.? Well, and there are. There are a number of different uh, types of heroin. You know, when we think now, I say when we, I'm talking people my age, and I, and I don't want to give that up uh, quite this soon in the conversation. <laughs> okay. but, uh, but I'm a child of the 60s. Let me just say that. And, uh, you know, when, I say, when we think of heroin, we think back of maybe in the 70s and so forth, we think of uh, heroin addicts overdosing in the in the gutters and in the back alleys of New York City, and uh, you know it has that such a negative connotation to it. Um, but heroin has really evolved, and heroin comes primarily from three different parts of well, actually now four different parts of the world. It comes from the uh, Southeast Asia, it comes from the Middle East and Afghanistan, it comes from Colombia. South America, and it comes from Mexico. It's only in those four places that the, the opium poppy, the plant uh, that produces morphine, which is then converted into heroin, where the plant is indigenous to. So it's grown in those four regions of the world. And historically, or, or going back into the 60s and 70s, most of the heroin coming into the U.S. came from Southeast Asia or from the Middle East. And over time, that has changed. The, the Colombian drug cartels realized what a profitable product heroin, uh, heroin was, so they really tried to market uh, heroin from South America into the U.S. 
but the quantities weren't quite there. They weren't able to corner the market because they just didn't have the supply. Um, now, now, I understand there are different types of heroin, and specifically, can you talk about why black tar heroin is considered the most dangerous? Sure. The the heroin that comes from Colombia and from the Middle East and from Southeast Asia, that's all uh, white heroin. And it's white heroin because it is synthesized uh, uh, more... Um, looking for the right word. It it synthesizes more. Let me just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And it becomes easier. It becomes water soluble. It's easier to dissolve in water. It's easier, therefore, to ingest into the human body. And it's refined better. It's a more refined brand or or style of heroin. Mm -hmm. The black tar heroin comes from Mexico. And that is not refined as well. And that almost has the consistency of like a Tootsie Roll almost. Mm-hmm. So it's gummy, it's it's dark and colored, it looks a lot like a little Tootsie Roll. Uh, it's not as it's not water soluble, it's a li- little bit more difficult to ingest. So um, as a result, it beca- got the nickname Black Tar Heroin because of, because of its appearance. Um, now, you've been quite vocal that most of the Black Tar Heroin is coming in through Mexico. So uh, how do we know that, and just how bad is that problem? Well, that's because that is where that's where the heroin is being produced. The black tar heroin is being produced uh, in the mountains on the uh, the eastern seaboard of Mexico. There, are, it's because of geography, there are only certain places that the opium poppy will grow, um, and it's being produced down there and manufactured and controlled primarily by the Sinaloa cartels. They produce the heroin, and the reason it has become so popular. Well, and there's a couple of reasons actually. One is because of America's appetite for prescription pain drugs. Mm -hmm. That is what has really fueled the appetite for black tar Mexican heroin. And uh, the other reason is that the Mexican cartels realized, unlike cocaine, where they did not control the production of cocaine, they merely purchased it wholesale and then sold it to us retail on the streets of America – Mexican cartels could control the heroin from actual production, from the poppy, all the way to the end user, all the way to the addict. So they controlled the entire life cycle of heroin from beginning to end. So let me understand this. Yeah, let me understand this, that that, that when it came to cocaine, they were actually acting as a middleman, a distributor. But, uh, but they could see that a lot of money was being left on the table by not controlling the source, whereas with black tar heroin, they can grow the poppies, and, and they are not acting as a middleman anymore. They're acting as the actual manufacturer. Absolutely. You've got mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Got it. So uh, if we know that this is being grown in Mexico and we know that that's where the supply is coming from and we know that there's a growing appetite in the U.S. and there's demand in the U.S., well, all you have to do is get the supply and the demand together, and I guess you have the problems we have today. Uh, that sums it up, doesn't it? <laughs> well, I didn't know if I was summing it up or not. I, I, I'm not. I, I'm not an expert on heroin. I, I need to make that clear to our listening audience in case there's anyone out there that because you know many times we talk about uh, interesting subjects and there's a, always a danger that the host gets affiliated with the subject. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to need you to uh, make it clear that I that we have never spoken before and I've never been personally arrested by you. <laughs> that is correct. Is that right? that okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad we got that straightened out. Uh, it's always touchy when you when you hit a subject like uh, drug enforcement and drug use. Uh, we're going to have to go to our first scheduled break, but when we come back, I'd like to talk to uh, a little bit about what law enforcement is actually doing to curb the influx of heroin from Mexico to the U.S. because we now know where the source is. We now know where the de- demand and the use is. And uh, so now, you know, how do you, how do you cut that off? Uh, that's a big question and uh, one we haven't handled very well in the past. So we'll talk about that when we come back from break. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. 
Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and drag and drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau.com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? Is your internet connection slow? Do you experience outages or dread calling customer support? How about your latency? Etheric Networks can help you. Etheric Networks is the Bay Area's locally owned alternative to DSL, satellite, and cable. Etheric provides fast, reliable, symmetric internet via our wholly owned network of towers covering the Bay Area from Salinas to Santa Cruz to Sausalito. We install a two-foot dish on your building and point it to one of our towers to connect you directly to the major data centers of Silicon Valley. Etheric directly connects to Tier 1 companies like Google, Facebook, and Amazon to ensure high-quality service from your building to the world. KSCO Business Special. Business service up to 10 megabits per second symmetric for as little as $299 a month with a $399 installation fee. Etheric also offers high-end 100 megabit and even gigabit and 10 gigabit service starting at $599 a month with installation starting from $500. Etheric Networks. Call 650-399-4200. Etheric.net. That's E-T-H-E-R-I-C dot net. So I'm watching the Warriors last night. Yeah. yeah. And a KSCO commercial comes on. Really? Oh, you saw the KSCO? Okay, so you guys have this commercial, yeah. a television commercial, and it's just shots of, of everyone. They, Rosie's in it. Yeah. Right. Oh, we just hired people off the street. No, no, that. no. Those are, I, this is legitimate. I'm verifying it. Those are actual faces, the people that work here. Yeah. And you have some guests that you're showing and everything. Uh-huh. And it's a great commercial. Looks great. It looks really well done. I'm I, don't, I, don't, I don't know who, I don't know who made it for you guys, but it looks really good. It's it's really well done. I just have one small comment. Oh God. Come on. Yeah. Where am I in the commercial? <laughs> you're holding the camera. I'm the only reason people listen to your station. Uh, I, it's true. It's true. What, you think people want to listen to the station because of. You? (laughs) Don't miss Good Morning Monterey Bay weekdays, 6 to 9 a.m. on KSCO AM 1080. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is heroin cartel expert and formerly the top special agent for the DEA, Mr. Steven Peterson. Now, we've seen mannequins hanging from ropes and strange threats uh, painted over uh, uh, overpass signs in some towns in Texas. So tell us, just how active are these Mexican cartels within the United States? Oh, they're very active. They're very active. They control most uh, of the drug trafficking that occurs in the U.S. today. And if you look back into the into the 70s and 80s, you know, the, the biggest drug threat to the United States were the Colombian drug cartels. And if you looked at our, our, our tactics for battling them back in the 80s, uh, not only did we start extraditing the leaders of the cartels, start indicting them in the U.S., 
But we actually sent uh, DEA agents together with special forces into uh, South America. We started blowing up cocaine processing laboratories. We started blowing up clandestine airstrips used to smuggle the drugs out. We ended up, uh, we were involved with the uh, task force that uh, ended up with a shootout and killing Pablo Escobar. Well, when the drug cartels saw this, we indicted and went and, and captured and brought back to the U.S. We extradited uh, Manuel Noriega. And was this with the cooperation of the foreign government uh, of the country you were acting in? Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. They wanted your help. And, yes, they did. So we went in there and we did these things. And we were very active. We were very, we were very aggressive. And this, this put the fear into the Colombian drug cartels. They thought, holy crap, we've, we've got to take this pressure off ourselves. We are, we, are, we are all walking around with bullseyes on our back from the U.S. government. And uh, so what they ended up doing is they ended up turning over, instead of being con- uh, sponsoring and controlling the shipments of drugs from, cent- or from South America into the U.S., they then turned it over to organizations that had been smuggling drugs into the U.S. for decades, but nobody cared. The Mexican cartels, prior to them actually even becoming cartels, Mexican uh, traffickers had been smuggling marijuana and methamphetamine and even heroin back into the 60s and before into the U.S., but nobody cared because it was just marijuana. And back in the 60s and 70s, heroin wasn't a big problem for the U.S., and the problems that existed were in the huge metropolitan areas like New York. So it doesn't, for the most of America, it wasn't a problem. And methamphetamine was controlled back then primarily by outlaw motorcycle gangs. And again, most Americans didn't care. So Mexican traffickers really had already developed routes, organizations. They had paid off politicians. They already had all this in place. The Colombians turned all this, all their cocaine over to the Mexicans. And initially it started on a, a fee basis. They would pay uh, the, the Mexicans money, cash, to smuggle the dope into the U.S. and then turn it back over to Colombians in the U.S. Well, that slowly changed to the point that the Mexican trackers then basically said, you know, forget it, we're not going to turn it back over to you. We'll just buy it from you wholesale, and we'll take it the rest of the way. Mm-hmm. So that's how things change. If we took the same aggressive stance against Mexican traffickers today that we did against Colombian traffickers in the 80s, I think you'd see a whole different landscape. Well, why aren't we? It worked there. <laughs> why wouldn't we use the same program that, that yielded success in Mexico? Well, uh, I have a lot of... Uh, opinions on that. Well, let, g- give uh, us your opinion. I mean, I mean it's a talk <laughs> show. We're getting to know each other. Well, why Why wouldn't we use the same program that was successful at uh, curbing the influx of cocaine? Why wouldn't we use that and apply that to Mexico, who is growing and uh, distributing heroin? Well, Mexico, while they give us great lip service about how they want our help, they, they, sadly enough, the government at all levels is so corrupt that this illegal contraband provides so much money and provides so much wealth for the so few in power in Mexico. So we don't, while we have lip service of how they want our help, they don't want it the same way the, the countries in South America wanted it in the 80s. In the 80s, the cartels were murdering judges and police officers, and they were killing politicians. Well, right now, while the Mexican cartels are slaughtering by the thousands civilians in Mexico, they haven't started wiping out all the politicians and judges and so forth in Mexico. Now, if that changed, you see a different perspective from the politicians in Mexico. And the current administration, this is the last thing in the world they want. They, they, they're... they're all excited about legalization of marijuana in Colorado. They're not going to want to go into a, an active, aggressive, uh, tactical battle with Mexico over drug trafficking down there. That doesn't suit anybody's narrative and certainly doesn't fit in with their beliefs. So that will never happen. So what you're saying is, is it's not in the interest of the uh, Mexican government uh, because this uh, income that comes in from heroin is a piece of the economy that down there. It's a vital piece of the economy, and uh, the cartels seem to be coexisting uh, with 
government officials, uh, even though they're slaughtering civilians. Um, and in, as far as the U.S. government goes, uh, we don't want any trouble. You're exactly right. So, so what you have is two governments that are a bit codependent and walking around the crime. So where does that leave the DEA? <laughs> I can tell you it's a great time to be a retired DEA agent. <laughs> because at least, I mean, the DEA, our hands are tied. We, we're not given the support we need to do the job. We're not, even, you know, the American public, you look at some of the, the polls that are taken, most Americans don't have a problem with legalized marijuana, you know. So the appetite for us to mo- become more aggressive in the war on drugs most people already see that as a failure. So they don't want to spend any more time, money, and energy working on that. But and, there's and, a big difference. I mean, I, I don't even, I'm not sure I even like to make the comparison between marijuana and heroin. There, that, that, that's, a, that's a football field away from each other. Uh, well, we're, you're talking about heroin uh, going that used to be 30 and 40 percent pure is now 50 to 90 percent pure. Absolutely, and it is a difference, there, and there is a connection because a lot of the the money that Mexican traffickers made was in the sale of marijuana in the U.S. And now that you have got such decreased uh, penalties and and laws against marijuana domestically, Mexican marijuana value and prices have plummeted. So they're losing money. Marijuana is no longer a cash crop for Mexican traffickers as it was. So a lot of the uh, growers of marijuana, if they're within the geographic boundaries that are conducive for opium poppies, they are getting rid of marijuana and growing poppies because that's the new cash crop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And that's not, that's the well, that's the new cash yep. crop. But think about what has happened here. Marijuana was the cash crop. Uh, pretty much, uh, their supplies uh, started to exceed demand. Uh, prices came down. Uh, what followed that was cocaine. Uh, they stuck themselves in the middle and became a distributor uh, and then uh, said, well, why should we do that when we can grow poppies and escalate to heroin? So we've gone from marijuana distribution to cocaine to heroin. So uh, it makes you wonder what comes next. We have to take another commercial break. St- stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from Stephen Peterson. You're listening to the Costa Report. Have you checked out the Costa Report blog yet? Well, what are you waiting for? There's no quicker way to find out what newsmakers are saying than the Costa Report blog at RebeccaCosta.com. It's where the former CEO of Apple and PepsiCo, John Scully, predicts where the next tech breakthroughs are going to come from. And also where Trent Lott explains why a GOP reversal of the Senate nuclear option will signal real change in our nation's capital. And the Costa Report blog is where you'll discover why Alan Dershowitz is worried that ISIS is adopting Hamas-like tactics. You'll find all this and more at the Costa Report blog. A new blog is posted every week, and they're short, pithy, and tell the unvarnished truth. Just go to RebeccaCosta.com to get the latest blog. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And while you're there, be sure to register for updates and breaking news. The Costa Report blog bringing you the news the big networks don't and won't. It's springtime in the Monterey Bay area, and that means it's time for the Home, Garden, and Lifestyle Expo at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds in Watsonville, April 18th and 19th. Get out of the city for some country fresh air, warm sunshine, and spring flowers, and find everything you need to renew your home, garden, and lifestyle for spring. You'll enjoy displays, demonstrations, and workshops from Central Coast home and garden professionals, entertainment for the family, a Gold Rush period restaurant, and much, much more. Ask the experts, meet your friends, eat great food, and enjoy the country air. There is really something for everyone at the Home and Garden Lifestyle Expo at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds in Watsonville. Admission and parking are free, so get out of town and go for the Country Home and Garden Lifestyle Expo April 18th and 19th at the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds. For meal tickets, information, or to become a vendor, visit SantaCruzHomeShow.com. That's SantaCruzHomeShow.com. 
Does your business do shipping and receiving? Or maybe you're packing up to move across town. Coast Paper and Supply meets all your needs at affordable prices. We have boxes of all shapes and sizes, as well as a variety of packing tape and tape guns. For your fragile items, we carry bubble wrap, shipping peanuts, and astrofoam. Shipping in bulk, we carry pallets and pallet wrap. You can find Coast Paper and Supply at 151 Josephine Street or at coastpapersupplyinc.com. You can also call us at 831-423-3350. Hi, I'm Rebecca Costa, host of the Costa Report. I don't know if you feel a little sluggish in the middle of the afternoon like I do, but if you do, I'm going to suggest you try Pollen Burst. It's an orange-flavored energy drink that comes in a packet, and it tastes a lot like that other orange drink the astronauts used to drink. You know the one. Pollen Burst contains vitamins A, B1, B3, B6, B12, pantothenic acid, vitamin D3, and gluconolactone, all designed to give you an energy boost that can last for hours. Pollen Burst comes in a box of 30 packets for $56 or two boxes for $100, and you can order it right now at kscoteam.com. The next time you feel tired and need a little boost, skip the coffee, soda, or candy bar and mix up a cold glass of Pollen Burst and do your body some real good. Go to kscoteam.com. Hi, I'm Greg. And I'm Marlene. And we're the hosts of Flavors. On KSCO 1080. We're going to be talking about restaurants, cookbooks. Wine and reviews. And all sorts of other things. If you like olive oils, this is the place. So remember to tune in on Sundays at noon. And remember, Flavors Everything. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, our guest today is Mexican drug cartel expert Stephen Peterson. So we hear a lot about these uh, DEA joint task forces between the U.S. and Mexican law enforcement making progress along the border. I- is that true? Well, define progress. <laughs> um, you know, you had asked me prior to our the, the last break there uh, about these bodies or mannequins being hung in effigy and these billboard signs and so forth. Yes. And, and that is occurring along the U.S. border. They are hanging mannequins from billboards and from overpasses. But if you go into Mexico, on the Mexican side of the border, they're actually, they're actually hanging human beings. And they, uh, they do this for a reason, the drug cartels do. They do this to send a message to those residents and the law enforcement presence on the Mexican border. They don't want the uh, they don't want interference. They're pretty much marking their territory and they're showing people there's a symbol out there that says silver or lead. It's written in Spanish. And it basically means accept my bribe or take my bullet. Become corrupt or we'll kill you. And what has happened over time is that the law enforcement the good people along the southern border are moving away from there. They don't want to be there anymore. They don't want to put up with, these, with the, this constant fear, the constant battles. So the good people are moving away, leaving behind either those people who are required to stay, law enforcement, or people who are involved in the illegal activities themselves and benefit from it, so therefore they stay. So most of the, the, the people that end up staying in these areas – are in some way involved in in the activities. And shortly after retiring, I've spent my entire career on the East Coast. I'm a Bostonian by birth and a North Carolinian now by choice. And uh, in light of this past winter, I'm so glad I've made that choice to move to North Carolina from Boston. But one of the first uh, speaking uh, uh, engagements I accepted after retirement was for DEA. DEA hired me a week after I retired, to go lecture at a leadership seminar they were having in Tucson, Arizona. And I was picked up at the airport by a young DEA rookie, an agent from Boston, who had been transplanted to Arizona as a result of being hired by DEA. So, you know, we are two two Bostonians, former Bostonians, 
have a little something in common. We've got a, a little ride ahead of us from the airport, so we're talking, and I said, you know, tell me what you see as the big differences between, say, Arizona and Boston. And he said, you know, in Boston and the East Coast, law enforcement, we all get along. We, we, there's a good camaraderie. There's a lot of professional courtesy. Here in Arizona, we have none. I mean, God bless, if you go five miles over the speed limit, the state troopers in Arizona are going to are going to ticket you, and you get into fights with them all. The time. Nobody cooperates with each other. He said, sadly, on the other spectrum, on the other side, you have in in on the East Coast most of the Mexican drug traffickers on the East Coast, where I where I live now, very few of them carry weapons because they realize that if they get caught with drugs, they're going to get their wrists spanked, they're going to get deported. They go back down to Mexico, and I believe the process is when you get to Mexico, you spin around three times, and you come back into the U.S. using a different name. To me, that, this appears to be the most logical explanation why we see these guys back all the time. But if you get caught with a gun, you'll go to prison first, serve time, then get deported. Nobody wants to go to prison. But Mexican traffickers along the U.S. border, specifically Arizona and those bordering states, not only do they all have guns, they all have automatic weapons. And they are literally in gunfights with law enforcement almost on a daily basis at some point along the border. And I said, well, why don't we hear about this? I'm in North Carolina. I watch the news. I consider myself an educated guy. Why do I not hear about this more? Because the media doesn't want to pick it up. Nobody wants to show the rest of America how dangerous it is to live on the border of Mexico, because the citizens would be outraged. People would go bananas, would demand the U.S. government do something. And you see it occasionally by the sheriff's offices and so forth along the border, filing lawsuits, trying to enforce the laws that nobody will allow them to enforce. Well, I think you make a good point. Uh, The media uh, conspires with this problem as well, because they do not cover and, and 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 they don't cover these stories for a reason, and that is the media is owned by big business. And if something is bad for business, uh, it doesn't get covered. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm really glad that this program remains independent. We're not owned by big business, and so we have this opportunity to speak to experts like you where we can bring this information to the American people. Now, I have to ask you, we've got so many technologies. We've got drone surveillance. We've got hackers that can download tools to their uh, personal computers and, and penetrate firewalls at Target. Why can't we take care of these cartels? Why, we know where, what the source is. We have technology. Why don't we solve this? Well, because the will to do this isn't there. The support isn't there. The programs have been in place for a lot of years. and and But now you're hearing all kinds of problems. Hey, wait a minute. DEA is maintaining phone record data from for decades based on what numbers call what numbers. And, you know, it, there was a movie out years ago called, uh, oh, God, it had Harrison Ford in it and uh, the – and he played a, a CIA guy, and I, I, it escapes me today what the name of the movie was. But it's a pretty popular movie. Clear and Present Danger was mm-hmm. the name of the movie. And in the movie, the Colombian drug cartels come into the U.S., and they murder the, uh, the secretary, and then they eventually have a big shootout with the FBI down in South America. Mm-hmm. All Hollywood stuff. Except the reason they determined who was involved in this murder is that – they picked up a, a small voice print off of somebody's voicemail, and they put it into a database, and they were able to identify who the murderer was of this thing. Well, as far-fetched as that seemed back in the 80s when this went on TV or when this played in Hollywood, all that technology existed back then, and DEA was using it. Well, that's exactly my point. We have technology that will identify who the drug traffickers are. And people are screaming about it because they see Big Brother. That, well, who, what are you doing? You're saving all this information. You have all this data. How dare you maintain and control this? And, and so it's a difficult fight at best because you have to balance the public's safety and with 
how much information do you maintain is always a well balance. i don't and, think i don't think the public is going to support surveillance or collecting that information if they don't know that there are gunfights every day in arizona and texas mannequins being hung uh road signs threatening law enforcement if they get in the way of these drug cartels i mean i don't see how the american people can be sympathetic with law enforcement or the DEA if that information never gets to them. I, I totally agree with you. And I, I, here we are back. I, I, we're, this, we're back to the problem. fact of the, that, that it, you know, this is being kept from the American people, and so we're not very sympathetic when the DEA says, hey, uh, not only do we need to collect greater information, we need government full support. In addition to the fact that what I hear from folks in the DEA is that many of these cartels are out uh, are out armed. They have better weapons and, and they have military grade bullet vests that they're oh, wearing that none of the local law enforcement can afford. Absolutely. I mean, you even look at the Zetas, one of the most violent cartels in New Mexico. They started as an enforcement arm using mercenaries and ex-Special Forces commandos from the Mexican military. So they brought all that hardware and so forth with them to, to do their job, and, and now they're, they're using that against us. And, and God bless, we have a riot in Ferguson, Missouri, and we get upset because the, the police bring in an armored truck to try to maintain peace during the riots. Mm-hmm. Because, oh, no, this is too militaristic now. Yeah, People except don't for what what they, I don't think they understand that the cartels are using military tactics. And not only that, they can afford the best weapons and the best protection, which local law enforcement rarely have the budget to, to afford themselves. Now, we have to take our last break, but stay right where you are. We'll be back after these important messages from our sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and and drag-and-drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most important impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now, because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. That's Tableau dot com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, and I have a question for you, Scott. What goes into making Method Champenois bubble? You know, it's a process that's really defined by the French government that we've taken and enacted into our wines, which really drive the quality of our sparkling project. So this is a process that the French government defines pretty specifically, and you remain faithful to that. Yeah, 100%, and in some places we push it a little bit. Now, how do the bubbles translate on the palate? You know, it really gives you that vehicle, that mousse for the character of the sparkling wine, carrying the fruit and the complexity. It's the expression of the wine. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I. Cellars, come taste the difference. It's the hard truth. In today's world, negative experiences quickly find a way to go online. One disgruntled customer, a bad employee, or broken personal relationship can easily post an ill-advised photo, tweet, rumor, story, bad review. And there it is right on page one when you search your name or business online. In the past, you had no way to fight back. Well, now you can. Grab a pen and take down this phone number or store it in your cell phone. But call 1-800-460-5733. That's 1-800-460-5733. When you call, you'll get free 
free info. Free info that'll show you how a reputation management company can easily build positive online content for you and legally bury negative information. This is not something you can do on your own. Don't lose any more business or miss out on another personal or business opportunity because of what is wrongfully being said about you online. Take control of your internet search results. Call 1-800-460-5733. That's 1-800-460-5733. Hurry, don't delay. Call 1-800-460-5733 today. No doubt about it. Spring is just around the corner, and that means it's time to get those RVs and boat, camper, and horse trailers ready to roll. Michael Olson here at RV Service Center, just off Highway 1 up at the top of Santa Cruz 2525 Mission. Rena, what do folks need to do to get their rolling stock back on the road? First, fire up all the appliances and make certain that they work. Stove, refrigerator, air conditioner, heater, and all the electrical components. Next, check out the things that are hard to see, like your running gear, axles, brakes, and tires. Don't want to lose a wheel or a horse while cruising down the highway. Wow, that sounds like a lot of very important work that needs to get done before folks hit the road again, Rena. Will you folks at RV Service Center lend a hand? You bet, Michael. We'll do a complete get-back-on-the-road spring checkup at RV Service Center. And to make it real easy, we'll do the Complete checkup for 25% off. Book your appointment today because we're getting real busy already. That's RV Service Center, 2525 Mission. Call today, 831-427-0881. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and our guest today is drug enforcement expert Stephen Peterson. So how much of the uh, Mexican and South American gang violence uh, in the U.S. today would you say is related to drug turf wars? I mean, are these just businesses that are competing for market share? (laughs) Actually, in a very barbaric way, yes. Yes. There are some cities, uh, some major cities, Chicago, L.A., a lot on the the West Coast, uh, that, uh, that have specific geographic turfs, territories for certain cartels. But you come to Charlotte, North Carolina, where I, where I live, uh, not the biggest city on the East Coast by any stretch, but we don't have one particular cartel that runs Charlotte. So, and there's a lot of cities about the same size as Charlotte that has that same uh, turf uh, allowance. And Well, you're not a big enough is, market. The, turf, well, the turf wars are going on in the big markets, right? Oh, well, see, I would, I would argue that. Really? Sure. Uh, I live in the Queen City now, right? I, I call it, mm-hmm. jokingly, I call it Mayberry, North Carolina. But I live in Charlotte, the largest city in the two Carolinas. Again, not a huge metropolis, but we have more black tar Mexican heroin in Charlotte than any other city east of the Mississippi. Is that right? We have more, yes, we have more than New York, St. Louis. We have more than Baltimore, and Baltimore has... By Kappa, the greatest number of heroin addicts in the now, United Now, I, I don't think of Charlotte and Baltimore as the big heroin uh, communities. Uh, I don't, am I just being naive? Or uh, well, no, no. Char- Baltimore has, uh, by population, they have the greatest number of heroin addicts in the country. Baltimore, of all places. But Charlotte, it's different. And I, I mentioned earlier on in the show that one of the reasons that we have such a huge heroin problem in the U.S. is because of our prescription pain pill problem we had a decade or so ago. And that is exactly why we have such a huge heroin problem today. A lot of people started taking prescription pain pills. They got hooked on the opiate. And an opiate addiction is the most difficult addiction to break of all, all the drugs out there. Even with professional help, most people fail uh, maintaining, uh, staying clean from an opiate addiction. So you have a very powerful addiction. And what happens is they get addicted to pain pills. And then over the years, the the government, DEA, primarily leading this battle, has made it more and more difficult for rogue doctors and pain clinics to just become licensed distributors of of prescription pain pills. Mm -hmm. So that market has started to dry up, and it's taken a long time to do this, but it it is working. If you were one of the addicts going to a, a pain clinic and getting pain pills, well, now your pain pills are gone, but the addiction still exists. So now you need, you need that drug. Where do you get it? Well, you could buy the pills off the street, 
And if you buy the pills off the street, you're going to pay up to $80 a pill, depending on the pill. But if you could buy black tar Mexican heroin, you can buy that for anywhere in Charlotte as low as $6 a balloon, $6 for a, for a dosage as opposed to $80 for a pill. And the morphine Dude, inside the black tar heroin will work just as well as a pain pill. Because that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, it's an opiate. It's Absolutely. An opiate. Right. So you're just basically, Absolutely. you're going from a legitimate opiate to an illegal opiate, but you're going to get the exactly. same effect. Exactly. And, and it's cheaper. And it's cheaper no to get. Cheaper. Nobody wants to do it. Plus, the Mexican traffickers, they, in Charlotte specifically, they, tar- they have a very specific target for their customers. They target yuppies. They target affluent white males between the ages of 16 and 25. That's their perfect demographic. How do they target them? When you say target, they're not ad- taking ads out on TV. No, how, but How they, do they do that? They, well, if you go to any public school in North Carolina in Charlotte, you'll find a small heroin problem. Not a big deal. But if you go to any of the private high schools in Charlotte, where there's, and there's quite a few that are pretty affluent, cost you $20,000 a year to send your kid to high school. They have huge heroin problems. But the schools don't want you to know this, because why would you pay twenty grand to send your kid to heroin high school? You wouldn't do that. So they try to keep this all very under wraps. But the fact of the matter is, the Mexican traffickers, they go to the places, they hang out where these affluent kids hang out and they start introducing it to them at parties and so forth and it's very trendy it's a very cool thing um but they they the mexicans see these customers as harmless they're rich little yuppie white kids with a phone and a car and money which is all the mexican traffickers want they know that these kids most of the time they don't have guns they're pretty harmless but they have money and before you know it sadly enough The kids start taking it, they start smoking it, because they think if they smoke the heroin, they won't get addicted, but they do. And very sadly, very depressingly, all avenues lead to the needle. Eventually, you're injecting. It doesn't matter how you start. Yeah, you could start with pills. You can start with embedding in food. It doesn't matter. Eventually, you're going to go to whatever's the quickest uh, relief. Exactly. And the quickest relief is always going to be a needle, isn't it? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. is to inject directly into the bloodstream. Um, uh, and that, that's, a, that's very sad. Now, uh, let me ask you just quickly in the time that we've got left here, uh, you've got the Sinaloa and the Zeta cartels. Uh, you would think that with uh, you know, all the action you see in business of consolidation, um, any chance that they get together or are they going to keep fighting each other in these turf wars? Well, you know, they started off back in the 80s. There, there was really just one cartel. Mm-hmm. And it broke, it d- divvied up into smaller groups because you you always have, you have uh, competition. You always have and, startups. Exactly. And you've got a guy, you'll get a guy who was work, he'll work his way up to a, a mid-level management position, if you want to call it that, within an existing cartel. He'll control a certain amount of guys and a certain amount of turf. And he'll control a certain number of avenues or smuggling routes into the U.S. And he'll feel, I can do this better and make more money personally if I break free of my group. Then you have other factors. You have political factors. They'll pay off politicians and they'll provide information to, to fight the competition. They'll basically inform on the competition to get the competition arrested or, or taken out of the picture. At the same time, they're paying off other politicians to open up routes to them. It's a constant battle. So the groups are always in flux. I do not see them all uniting. If mm-hmm. anything else, I see them breaking up into more and more smaller groups as right. time goes well, on. Well, you, you see the, uh, the growth of entrepreneurship because there's money to be made there. Unfortunately, Mr. Peterson, we, we are all out of time for today, uh, but I want to thank you for opening our eyes to the real situation and for bringing this information to the American people. Before we say goodbye, I'd like to take an opportunity to thank you for your continued service to our country. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca, for having me on there. I appreciate it. My dad also appreciates it by you continually <laughs> calling me Mr. Peterson. I'm sure he enjoys it. Well, say, it. say hello to your father and uh, come back anytime. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity.
If your station is leaving us after the first hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Stephen Peterson, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you missed the full interview with Peterson or any of our other guests, you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our new YouTube channel. And while you're at our website, take a moment to check out the videos, the blogs, articles, and commentaries by people you know, folks like Richard Branson and Trudy Styler, Donald Trump, and E.O. Wilson. Our web team does a fantastic job of keeping that website chocked full of content, uh, including a calendar which shows when I'll be speaking in your area and you can see me live. So uh, be sure to go there and and don't miss the blog, folks. If you haven't uh, if you haven't gone and clicked on the blog feature at the top of the home page do do so it's a, it's quite spectacular uh, our team does a great job of capturing the headlines of each guest interview so if you miss an interview you can pretty much capture the news through the blog um, all you have to do is click on the pull down menus at the top of the home page at rebeccacosta.com that's pretty easy to remember it's my name.com Next week, we have a special guest who was unable to confirm with us prior to airtime today. So I'm going to ask you to check your local station for next week's guest or visit our website for the guest biography and the topics that they'll be speaking about. Trust me, when the producers keep the host in the dark about a guest, it's going to be a good one. So I hope you'll join me again next week on the only program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. No matter what business you're in, what happens in Washington can make the difference between business success or failure. That's why understanding where government is headed is so important in today's competitive business environment. But where can you find experts who know firsthand the inner workings of our nation's capital? The American Program Bureau is your leading source for speakers whose experience offer unique insights into where U.S. policy is headed. Speakers like Seth Harris, former acting U.S. Secretary of Labor, Alyssa Mastromonaco, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, and General Carl Eikenberry, former U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan. For your next meeting or conference, contact the American Program Bureau at apbspeakers.com or 617-614-1600. That's apbspeakers.com. The American Program Bureau, making history one speech at a time. Physicians Medical Group of Santa Cruz. Independent physicians for independent people. Consider this. Hundreds of doctors in Santa Cruz County all working together to provide the care that's right for you. It's the reality for PMG patients. Since we're independent, we're free to employ best practices right away, saving you time, money, and delivering the best outcome through communication. Visit PMGSCC.com. Join me for It's a Question of Balance with Ruth Copland Saturday evening, 8 till 10. My in-depth arts interview is with James D'Alessandro, Hollywood screenwriter, filmmaker, and author of 1906, best-selling historical novel about the earthquake and fire of 1906 in San Francisco, the anniversary of which is this Saturday, 18th of April. And I go out and about for questions that matter to interview people on the street about this week's topic. Join me Saturday evening, 8 to 10 on AM 1080 or ksco.com live stream. Serving Northern California for over 65 years. This is KSCO Santa Cruz. This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. 
Welcome back to the second hour of the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and during the first hour of today's program, we spoke with one of the most knowledgeable DEA special agents in our country's history, Mr. Stephen Peterson, who has spent almost three decades in the field and trained 80,000 local, state, and federal drug enforcement experts. And with so much of today's media focused on terrorism and foreign affairs, I wanted to take a step back and look at a growing problem, which we seem to have taken our eyes off of, uh, but one which the death of uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman and and uh, the growing number of addicts which are entering rehab should give us plenty of warning is escalating pretty quickly. Black tar heroin is flowing into the United States in volumes which have we have never experienced, and and this has caused supplies to not only become plentiful, but also cheap. The fact is, um, I I put what our guest during the first hour, uh, what he had to say to the test this past week. Uh, I had heard the stories of how easy it was to get heroin, particularly on private on the campuses of private schools and universities. But frankly, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be real honest with you. I didn't believe it. So with embarrassingly little investigation, we were able to locate a dealer. And we met with that dealer, showed him our cash, at which point he produced a small amount of black tar heroin. Now, before you start sending me any emails or you call the police on me, I I, want to be sure you know that we did not make the purchase. (laughs) Let me say that again. We did not make a purchase. That would have been illegal. But but we did look the goods over instead, and we thanked him, and uh, we said we'd be back when we had more cash, that we didn't have enough money. At no time did we were any threats made, or did we feel that we were in any danger. In fact, uh, the person was a rather sophisticated uh, university student. Uh, the dealer was friendly, and he seemed genuinely interested in cu- cultivating a new customer in a long-term relationship. But he even went so far as to offer us a sample at no cost to take with us uh, in case we were concerned about quality. But, of course, we did not accept. Again, we didn't make a purchase. We did not accept any heroin. Uh, we let him know that we'd heard the quality was just fine, and we weren't concerned about that. Now, most of you listening to this program know that I'm a pretty straight individual. Uh, I like to keep my nose clean. I pay my taxes on time. I mow my lawn once a week. I keep my car washed. Yep, I'm that that person, that person you you don't like. (laughs) So, But when a person like me who has no drug contacts and doesn't know the name of a single rap artist or a brand of marijuana can make a few inquiries and get to black tar heroin on the street. Well, you know, this is how you know what Peterson is saying is true. It's here. It's here, folks. It's here in unlimited supply, and all you need is money and a phone. So if there's any question about whether the war on drugs has been effective, well, I think that pretty much answers that. Which begs the next question, what are we going to do about it? Do we just make all drugs legal and hope that humans will refrain from being uh, addicts in the same way they refrain from drinking a six-pack of beer before breakfast and they have to head off to work? Should we rely on every individual to use self-control and stop the charade that we're somehow in control of the amount of drugs that are coming into the U.S.? Or do you think this is another reason we must seal our physical borders off and to use every technology that we have uh, at our disposal to do so. After all, these drugs have to be transported. They're physical objects. They have to be transported into the U.S. And we now know where they're coming from and who's producing them. You seal up the borders, uh, put law enforcement on those borders, and the transportation stops. And uh, all you have to, all you have then are the possibility of uh drug cartels using airplanes, and we can monitor air traffic coming from the south uh, a little more carefully and and, uh, probably close that loophole as well. I think all too often when we speak about the drug problem in the U.S., we overlook the simplest solution of all. When you stop the transportation, you stop the drugs. 
We may not be able to stop people from growing heroin or trying to distribute it. We may not be able to stop gangs from turf wars, which, with the exception of violence, is not really much different than the rivalry between Pepsi and Coke for market share. They're just trying to get more customers. Uh, But what we can do is shut down the ability to transport the, the products, the goods, into the U.S. You can't distribute a physical substance over the Internet, at least not today, Uh, One day when 3D printers, uh, which, by the way, can now print meat, uh, can print morphine uh, or black tar heroin, um, we're going to have a a different kind of problem. You'll be able to print those drugs at home. And I don't really know how we'll stop anybody from printing anything at home. But I suppose we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Where 3D printers are concerned All you have to do is go on the Internet and do a little research, and you'll see that the price of 3D printers have come down to $2,500, $3,000, and you can print everything from a plastic bucket to a pair of shoes. Uh, When you get to that point, in in fact, uh, I urge you to go on on YouTube. You can see a fellow printing a plastic gun, I think over the course of two or three hours. He assembles it, and he goes out, and he uses it to fire seven rounds. So... We can talk about gun control. We can talk about uh, uh, drug uh, control. But, in fact, uh, technology is going to make it very, very, very hard to control anything once 3D printers uh, are everywhere and are that cheap. On that note, we're going to have to take another break. When we come back, Sam Quentin and Bill Graff will join me in the studio, and you'll have the pleasure of hearing from a liberal, a conservative, and an independent. You're listening to The Costa Report. 